Y'all ready to get into the scriptures? Let's do that. Let's get started. New study, applied relationships. And um, we're going to be looking, we're going to be looking at some really, I think some, well, my prayer is, is that it's really helpful and practical for all of us. Uh, the idea of, of our relationships and, and how significant those are. Today, it's going to be pretty much, I'm, I'm going to give, uh, I want us to just kind of have an overview, kind of look at the scriptures and, and see the importance that the Bible, that the scriptures place on relationships. But we're going to be talking about several things in the context of this study. We're going to be talking about how to, how to navigate those difficult relationships, right? Whether it's whoever it might be, whether it's a spouse, whether it's a family member, whether it's a, 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 a sibling, whether it's a friend, but navigating those, diff- I'm sure we've all had those kind of relationships, right? Those difficult relationships, yeah? No? One of us, two of us? I'll tell you what, I'm pretty sure all of us have been that difficult relationship <laughs> ourselves. I'm sure, we, I'm sure we all fall into that category. I know I certainly have. Uh, and so we're gonna, but we're gonna talk about what do the scriptures say? How do we navigate those difficult relationships? One of the things we're gonna look at, I'm really looking forward to, is what do, what, what, what do we do? How do we, how do we respond and how do we kind of, how do we navigate that, the aspect of a relationship where trust is broken, where trust is betrayed? What is, how, how is that rebuilt and what does that look like? How do we apply, how can we apply the love of God in all kinds of uh, situations in in our relationships and and so those are a lot of the things that we're gonna that we're gonna tackle in these next few weekends. But as I said before, I, I wanted to take a, a little bit of time and just look at just a, an overview and look at the the significance that the scriptures place on our relationships. And one of the things that I mentioned in our starting point, uh, which is our uh, new member orientation, uh, and, and if you've been in that, you've you've heard me say that. Basically, everything that's written in the scriptures, everything that's written in the scriptures falls under one of two categories. It either falls under the category of our relationship with God, the vertical relationship, or it falls within the category of how we relate to one another, our horizontal relationships. But everything that we look at in the scriptures falls under one of those two categories. The Ten Commandments. The first four commandments deal with our relationship with God. The remaining six commandments deal with our relationships with others. God is a God of relationships. And so the way he's designed this whole thing is not only a relationship with him, but also relationships with one another and, 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 and the importance of that. So, for example, God gave us a free will because he is a God of relationships. In other words, he wants us to love him and serve him and follow him because we choose to do that out of a desire for a relationship, not because he's inserted a microchip in us that's programmed us to serve him. There's no relationship involved in that. So with a free will, you can say no to God. You can say yes to God. You can obey or you can disobey. How of you re- recognize he doesn't stop you? He doesn't body block you when you're on your way to do something you're not supposed to do. He's a God of relationships. And so my point in that is he's designed this whole thing called Christianity. And the two two parts of Christianity, the two components, our relationship with God, our uh, our relationships with one another. And so God's designed it in such a way that it only works, it only works for us and for others within the realm of relationship. Uh, let me illustrate it this way. Any growth that we, that we experience beyond our initial commitment to Christ always involves others. Okay? So that almost bears repeating. Any, any growth that we experience beyond our initial commitment to Jesus always involves others. In other words, discipleship never happens alone. It involves other people. So I grow and get better, not only because of my relationship with God and his word and his spirit, but because I'm also experiencing the strength of that in my relationship with others. Now, there have been some folks that say, well, you know, uh, and I've seen it in, in years past and all the years that I've been doing this. I, now, obviously, you know, there's folks that have come to Christ and they just, 
are convinced they don't need the local church. They don't need other people. They just need Jesus. They just need the Holy Spirit. That's more than enough. That's all that I need. And, and I will just tell you, I'll just tell you, please understand how I'm saying this. But every time I've been, a, 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 I've run across people like that, that that's been their approach. I know they, they love the Lord. They do. They love the Lord with all their heart, but they're always a little weird. They, they just don't function well with the rest of, I mean, the, they, the com- whole community, we're all a part of, you know, somehow that, that it's not right. Something's not quite right there. And that's because discipleship doesn't happen alone. Matter of fact, you know, we've got all these new life groups starting up. We don't do that just because every church in America has life groups. It's the thing to do. It's the trend. It's the cool thing. Let's have life groups, you know, and we've got, a life, we've got these life group menus. We, we have them back there at the Welcome Center. But, but the reason why we do this is because we realize that we do well, we grow, we get stronger, in, even in our relationship with God as we are strengthening our relationships with one another. As we're doing life together, as there's care and accountability that's happening. People care about us. We sense that, mute the love of God between us, but there's also that accountability. And, and, and it's just awesome when you have, when you, when you kind of go, when you're kind of drifting and getting off the rails a little bit, or you're, you're maybe on the brink of making a bad decision. Man, I'm telling you guys, it's just beautiful to have, to be in relationship where a good friend will say, mm, let's talk about that. What did you say you were going to do? Oh, yeah, I'm going to do this. That's not a good thing. I don't think you should do that. Well, it's none of your business. Well, it isn't any of my business. Well, it's not my business. I can't tell you what to do, but I can be a friend to you and say, that's a bad move. Amen. Does that make sense, everybody? Right? You know? And I will tell you this. When you're having those sinful thoughts and you've got relationships and you're in relationship with people, it's really interesting if you call that friend up and say, you know, I'm thinking about doing such and such. As soon as it comes out of your mouth and hits your ears, you realize how absurd it is. And then you just say, never mind, and you hang up. (laughs) And your friend just helped you right there. It's beautiful. One of the things that we see here in the scriptures, and this will bring us to 1 Corinthians 15, is that our relationships, our interpersonal relationships, our friends, uh, our relationships either strengthen us or they weaken us in our relationship with God. So our relationships, based on what we've just said, our relationships, therefore, either strengthen us or they weaken us. Now, the reason why, I know that doesn't seem necessarily all that profound, but there's something kind of, there's something tucked away in that statement that I think is important for us to see. And that is this, there, there's, no, uh, there's no gray area. In other words, our relationships are literally either strengthening us or they're weakening us. There's not any such thing as a benign relationship. There's not anything that's a neutral relationship. It's not like, well, I can, I can do life with this person. I can spend a lot of time with this individual. I can hang out with this person and it's not really gonna bother me. No, there is no such thing as that. Our relationships are either doing one of two things. They're either moving us closer and stronger in God or they're pulling us away. It's one of the two. That's why the scriptures talk to us about how important our relationships are. Like 1 Corinthians 15, it says, don't be fooled by those who say such things that it doesn't matter, for bad company corrupts good character. Let me, let me read this from another translation. Don't let anyone deceive you. Associating with bad people will ruin decent people. Okay? And so it's, that's why parents, as parents, we're always concerned about who our children are spending time with. And what's true for them is also true for us as, adult, as adults, that the people that we hang with, that we do life with, that we connect with, if they're unhealthy, we become unhealthy. Does that make sense, everybody? You see what I'm saying? And it's just, it's just that, it's not really that complicated. Bad company corrupts good character. And I know a lot of times the lie of the enemy is this, that, that I'm going to be a light I'm going to be the salt of the earth. I'm going to be a light. So I'm going to hang out with these people in hopes that somehow I'll be able to win them over to God. 
That, it doesn't work like that. I'm not saying that we're not salt and light, but it doesn't work like that. So, so let me illustrate it this way. People often say this, I hear this often, and, and, and they make the statement that Jesus hung out with sinners. Jesus hung out with sinners. No, he didn't. I know some of you right away are going, whoa, I was with you up to that point right there, Pastor Mike. Let me say it again. Jesus didn't hang out with sinners. Jesus spent time with sinners. Jesus ate with sinners. Jesus inserted himself into their lives. He spent time with them, but he didn't hang out with them. In other words, Jesus, when he was with them, had an agenda. He had a strategy. He had a plan. And that was to teach them and love them and bring them out of darkness into the light, bring them out of strongholds into freedom. He didn't just hang out with them. Y'all get what I'm saying, right? And so this is what 1 Corinthians 15, Paul the Apostle is saying, look, I'm not saying you're not around them. I'm just saying you need to have a strategy and agenda, but you're not just hanging with them. Because if you want to just hang with them, you're already on a slippery slope. And bad company will corrupt good character. They'll lead you in the wrong path. It says this in Proverbs uh, chapter 13, verse 20. Walk with the wise and become wise. So this is all have to do with the first point. Our relationships either strengthen us and our relationship with God or they weaken us. So it says walk with the wise and you will become wise. Associate with fools, and you'll get into trouble. The righteous should choose his friends carefully. That's not saying that you, you choose who you talk to, choose who you love, choose who you help. That's not what he's saying. The people that we're connecting ourselves to and with, we're to do that carefully. Why? For the way of the, li- the wicked leads us astray. So again, you walk with the wise, you become wise. It's a beautiful principle. If you associate with fools, you become foolish or you get into trouble. Years ago, I I shared a a statement that I'd heard. Uh, This was, I think it was a pastor, if I remember correctly, because this was probably in in 95 or something, or the first time I heard this statement, a pastor from Nigeria, and he said, he said, uh, here's a statement he said. He said, never buy clothes from a naked man. That was it. Never buy clothes from a naked man. Now, that is deep. And, and, and I think, I'm hoping, honestly, part of me is really hoping that I see that statement on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Never buy clothes from a naked man. What was he saying? How can you buy clothes from a naked man? How does that even work? What he was saying is, is don't get advice or counsel from someone who is naked in the area that you need help. So in other words, if you're having difficulty with your marriage, don't go to a person who doesn't do well in marriage because you're buying clothes from a naked man. You're both naked. Nobody's, you're not gonna help, you're not gonna help each other. If you're looking for financial advice, don't look, don't get advice from somebody who constantly gets themselves into financial trouble through foolishness, or you're going to be a fool as well in that area. Don't buy clothes from a naked man. Find somebody that excels in that area and gain wisdom from them. Does this make sense, everybody? This all has to, our relationships either strengthen us or they weaken us. The other thing that we see here is our relationships are also a barometer for our relationship with God. I've noticed this. I'm sure you have too. That that when, I, when, this, when I'm doing well here, when I'm hitting on all eight cylinders here, I seem to do better here. So when I'm doing well here, I seem to be more patient here and more kind here and more forgiving here and more long-suffering here, right? When this is off a little bit is when I find myself being a little more abrasive or caustic. I'm short-tempered. I'm a little curt. My patience isn't what it should be. I'm a little jaded. I'm a little cynical. I find myself being critical or judgmental. Please, I'm not the only, don't make me feel like I'm the only one that feels that. That's about, that's about, thank you. <laughs> and so the tendency might think everybody, everyone's, everyone's crazy until we realize we're the common denominator in all of it. Maybe it isn't them. Maybe 
I need, God, maybe I need an adjustment here so I can experience more life here, so I can even give more life here. Maybe I need to experience more grace here so I can extend more grace here. But what I'm saying is it's a barometer for us. It helps us locate ourselves many times. Here's what, it, here's, here's what we read in Mark 12. One of the scribes came to Jesus. They heard him reasoning. They perceived that he had, that he had answered them well in the previous questions. And so there's, here's what they asked Jesus. Which is the first commandment of all? Which is the first, the first commandment of all? And Jesus said, the first is love God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. This is the first. And the second is like it, which is love your neighbor as yourself. And then Jesus said, there is no other commandments greater than these two. But notice what he said. Here's why I say that. Uh, our relationships with others helps locate us. It's a barometer. Why? Because they ask Jesus, what's the first commandment? The first. What needs to happen first? What comes first? What needs to be placed first? Well, love God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Jesus said, that's the first. In other words, keep that locked in, and then you'll be able to do the second, which is love your, love your neighbor as yourself. If I'm having trouble loving my neighbor... And sometimes I do. And I'm serious. Sometimes I do. I mean, there's sometimes I'm just like, Lord. I, I, I'm thinking of people right now. <laughs> Not anybody here. So, oh, no, I mean it. Not anybody here. But I'm thinking about what's happening in the world out there. And I'm like, oh, Lord. You know, it's possible to be right and wrong at the same time. It's possible to be right in our assessment of a situation or an individual and be wrong in our heart about it at the same time. It's possible to be right in our assessment and wrong because we're in judgment and we've stepped out of love, right? And so Jesus said, look, you want to make sure this is happening really well? Make sure this is happening really well. And if this isn't going well, instead of over-evaluating everybody else in your life, take two steps back and say, God, am I missing something here that you need to make an adjustment in? <laughs> right, everybody? I'm telling you, this is just practical stuff. And I've seen it over and over again. The times when I'm short with Bonnie... I guarantee you 99.99% of the time, it's not Bonnie. It's something I'm off and I need to line up. Amen, right everybody? It's amazing how loving God with all of our heart helps us see the rest of the world more accurately. It's amazing how loving God with all of our heart helps us. That, that, what happens is when we give out and love him with all of our heart, he gives us an overabundance of love so we have more to spare to love the people around us. We've got this excess, this overflow. Here's the last point just kind of in this overview of just the significance, the importance of our relationships in the scriptures. And that's this, number three, godly relationships are developed intentionally on purpose. They don't happen by happenstance. Now, God can, le can bring a godly person into your life, but then it's up to us to pursue that relationship. It's up to us to intentionally conscientiously develop that. Because I guarantee you there are times in our pasts, all of our pasts, where God has brought a godly person in our life. We didn't recognize what God was doing. We didn't recognize the benefit of that relationship and we didn't pursue it. We didn't develop it. Matter of fact, we might have been dismissive of it. And then later on, we, we circle back around or we look back and we go, wow, I think that was the Lord trying to help me by bringing that person in our life. Does that make sense, everybody? But it's something we develop. We develop it. We, we, we have to be intentional with that. Now, he, he, let me give you a passage of scripture that, that I think just illustrates this so beautifully. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22. Paul is talking to this young man, Timothy. I'd read this verse, I don't know how many times, as a Christian for you know, 45, almost 50 years, I've read this tons of times. I remember several years ago when I noticed something 
that I hadn't noticed before. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22 says this. He tells uh, Timothy this. Flee also youthful lusts. Flee youthful lusts. But pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Well, first of all, it says flee youthful lusts. He's not just talking about lust in a sexual way or a sexual connotation, though it does include that or involve that. He does say that you have to flee youthful lust or flee lust, even in a sexual con- uh, context, which this is not a part of the point, but can I just, I, I think it's just important to say this as your pastor, as a sidebar, is that anytime there's sexual uh, temptation, you never try to, you, you never try to outthink it. Don't ever try to outmaneuver it. Don't think you're too strong for it. Don't try to square off with sexual temptation. Run. Flee. Just run out of that situation like your hair's on fire. If you're in a place and the gal looks at you with that look, you know, that inviting look or a wink of an eye, you need to turn around and act like you've lost your mind and just leave, run. Right? So Paul told Timothy, flee youthful lusts. But here's the other thing too. If lust is not just a, in a sexual way, but you, you can also read it this way. Flee the sins of immaturity. Flee the passions of youth. And here's how he says, here's what you need to do. He says, if you're fleeing this, you have to at the same time be pursuing this. In other words, the only way we can actually successfully flee the harmful is by pursuing the righteous. When we're pursuing this, we're automatically fleeing the other. So he says, pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace. And here's what I never saw before. With two words, he says, with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. So he was telling Timothy, as you're pursuing righteousness, love, joy, and peace, you will not conquer those alone. Find people who are also pursuing the same thing. Lock arms with them. And if you'll pursue them together, then you will together accomplish and conquer and capture righteousness, joy, love, and peace in your heart. Man, you got to do it on purpose. It's got to be an effort that you make. That you, you, you're looking for those godly relationships and you're pursuing those godly relationships. I, I said this in the first service. I want to give you permission. If you're, I'm going to give you permission here. If you're here in the, in the worship center after service, and, or you're in the atrium, and, and there's a group of people talking, and you know they're godly people, they love the Lord, and you hear they're going to Jason's Deli across the street, I'm going to give you permission, whether they know you or not. Walk up and say, did I hear you all going to Jason's Deli? I'm going there too. I guess that's lying, unless you really were. I don't want you to lie, but you understand what I'm saying. <laughs> that might not have been the best illustration, but uh, as I think about it. But, but what I'm saying is, is you, you initiate that. I, I did that. I, I'm not telling you something I didn't do. I remember Bonnie and I going through a really difficult time. We were being restored. I was really needing to get my relationship back on track. And I'm, I'm, I was standing in the lobby of the church we were attending, and there was a group of guys that were just, I knew were godly men. And I admired them, and I heard they were going to, to dinner, uh, you know, after church at some little place, IHOP or something like that. And I said that to him. I said, y'all going to IHOP? Yeah. Can I go? I just invited myself. Here's what I thought. If they're godly men, they're going to say yes. <laughs> if they're not godly men, they're going to go, well, what are you talking about? Get out of here. All right, never mind. I was wrong. <laughs> I did. And it helped me because I got around some guys that encouraged me to read the Bible, trust God, pray, love my wife, love my kids. You know what I'm saying? It was just so helpful and I needed it so bad. I couldn't have done it without them. Now, are you saying Jesus wasn't enough? No, he's more than enough. He just set it up that I just need Jesus. It's not anything lacking in Jesus. It's lacking in me. I need Jesus and I need some good godly friends 
to make it go well. Is that, amen. Does that make sense? Let's all stand to our feet. As we close out, and I know we went a, went a little bit longer, but as we close out, we, we, have these, we have communion stations in the front and in the back. What's neat about communion is the table represents two things. This is great. You know what I'm going to say. It represents our relationship with God and it represents our relationship with others. Paul the Apostle says, it's at the table that you can forgive people, find the grace to forgive people. It's at the table that you can find more love and kindness and patience and long-suffering. It's also at the table that we're reminded of how much God's forgiven us and how much He loves us. I want to encourage you to take advantage of what's rightfully yours, that experience of communion. So as the worship team leads us and as we close out in this final song, let's worship the Lord together. Let's worship Him in song. Let's worship Him at His table. And let's ask God just do something in our hearts. Amen. Let's worship Him.